Jim Sarian tells of a time when one of his congregation's organizations, the Women's League, wanted to announce a new project and they had undertaken for the church. Well, on that particular Sunday morning during the announcement time, the president of the Women's League came up to announce a new project that the women were going to offer to take upon themselves. After a brief description, the president called for all the ladies of the League, a group mostly of 55 and older and up female saints, to march up to the front of the sanctuary so that the congregation could see the earnestness of their endeavor. <coughs> well, Jim Syrian was the pianist for the church and decided to give the ladies a marching tune to encourage them as they came down the aisle. He started to play the children's chorus, The Lord's Army, mm -hmm. to keep in step with the march. He says, in my head, I was hearing the familiar words, I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. Unfortunately, everyone else was hearing the words of the original tune, tune the old gray mare. <laughs> <laughs> she ain't what she used to be. <laughs> ain't what she used to be, ain't what she used to be. <laughs> he said one of the surprise women leagues president asked why I was playing the tune, I got so flustered I couldn't answer, so I just left through the side door. <laughs> Music often carries a message to our lives. Music encourages a message of love. For example, how many of you, when you were dating, had a song that was kind of your song? You know, <clears throat> When a couple is in love, they often speak of a particular song as being our song because it triggers memories of intimacy and affection they shared from the beginning. Music can also speak of depression. Country music is known for this kind of message. Many of these songs tell stories of lost loves, lost loves, ruined relationships. Do you know what happens if you play a country song backward? The guy gets his house back, his wife back, and his truck back. <laughs> songs written back in the 60s had a special message as well. Do you remember that the underlying theme of music back in the 60s was protest? They protested the war, they protested against authority, they protested against anyone telling them what to do or where to go. And then there was the music that communicated anger, rage, and defiance. Music styles such as heavy metal and rap often set forth this message, even when you can't understand the words. Music communicates to us. In fact, music's ability to communicate is so powerful that even the military recognizes its importance. Believe it or not, at the Pentagon School of Music, it takes 15 months to ins of instruction to produce one band leader. By contrast, the Air Force takes only 13 months to train a jet pilot. <laughs> Music has power. It's the power to communicate, the power to inspire, the power to change. According to Don Campbell, the founder of the Institute of Music, Health, and Education, music can communicate to us even when we're not influenced by the words of a song. He says music impacts physiology on a deep and basic level. The human heartbeat is essentially attuned to sound. Changes in tempo and volume act, act as natural peace, pacemakers. Breathing slows down and speeds up along with the music. In addition, music has a direct effect on the function of the brain. It can slow down and equalize brain waves to create a meditative state, or it can energize brain waves, quickening the thinking process and enhancing creativity. Even the cells of your body respond to music. A study at MSU found that just 15 minutes of listening to music could increase levels of immune chemicals vital to protect against disease. By contrast, the release of cortisol, the stress hormone, dropped by up to 25%. That was sourced at his bottom line tomorrow from September of 1998. So what is all this telling us? It tells us that music is a powerful force. It communicates messages to our lives. It communicates messages to our hearts and to our minds, and even the very cells in our bodies. 
Now secondly, here in Colossians 3, God is telling us that we need to use the power of music. In the New King James Version we read, Let the peace of God rule your heart, to which also you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the words of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. So God wants us to use music as a tool to strengthen ourselves and also encourage others. But how can music help us as Christians? First, music can change our attitudes, yours and mine. In the Old Testament, we're told that in the later days of his reign, King Saul turned away from God. And so God left Saul and an evil spirit moved in there. The result was King Saul was driven nearly to the point of madness. Out of his, one of his counselors told him that he knew of a young man whose singing might just help relieve his burden. Well, that was David. He came to sing to King Saul's court. And we're told that when David would take his harp and play, then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. For Samuel 16. So music can change our attitudes. It has the power to make us melancholy or moody. A pastor who went to Purdue University decided to live life his own way. He wouldn't shave, he didn't feel like it, and he didn't even brush his teeth. He intended to listen to his music as much as possible. And after about three months, he seriously began to entertain thoughts of suicide. This so shocked him that he began to take stock of what he'd been doing with his life. He began to take more pride in personal hygiene and his appearance. And he took a close look at the type of music that he was surrounding himself with. His favorite group at the time was the singing group Simon and Garfunkel. He'd listened to them for hours, but as he examined the messages of their songs, he discovered a pattern of despair and hopelessness. One song compared man's life to that of a rat maze. Another declared, I am a rock, I am an island, I touch no one and no one touches me. He realized he needed to remove that influence from his life and replace it with more upbeat and hopeful music. By contrast, when he was later in Bible college, he had a part-time job in the back room of a furniture store as a furniture stripper. My job was to take old chairs and tables, dip them in a horse tank filled with methylene chloride, which would strip off the old paint and varnish, and then take the treated furniture over to a shower stall where you'd spray them off and set it aside to be refinished by a more skillful, skillful labor. So it was a lonely, smelly, unpleasant job that nobody liked. The worst part was the methylene chloride was like acetone with an attitude. If it touched your skin, it would burn like crazy. And so he was forced to wear eye protection and huge rubber gloves. One day in a Bible class, he encountered Ephesians 5, 19 to 20, which spoke of ways in which we could be filled with the Spirit. It says, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, and always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus. Christ. So the pastor thought he'd try that at work. He was alone for three or four hours at a time, and he could do any crazy thing he wanted. So he'd sing and pray and just worship God in his little cathedral. After a couple of weeks, his boss pulled him aside and asked him what he'd been doing back there. A little confused, he asked what he meant. He said, I don't know what you're doing back there, but I've never seen anyone come out of that room before with a smile on their face. <laughs> what are you doing back there? What he'd been doing was obeying the command from Ephesians 5. He had changed his attitude. By singing and praying and praising God, he had risen above his circumstances and allowed God's Spirit to work in him. So that brings me to the second point. Music is not only changes you and I, Music can give us the power to take control of our circumstances as well. Ordinarily, we don't control our circumstances, they kind of control us. 
So life can get us down and people can be cruel. We end up being imprisoned by our circumstances. But we don't have to be. In Acts 16, we read that Paul and Silas were in the city of Philippi. They had been preaching and healing and casting out demons. Something about what they were doing upset the authorities, though. And the town magistrate had them beaten with rods, thrown in the inner parts of prison and placed in stocks. This wasn't right, it wasn't fair, this was unjustly cruelty. Yet in Acts 16, 25 following, it tells us, At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loosened. What happened to Silas and Paul was right wasn't right, wasn't fair, that this type of thing had happened to us, I dare say we would have been filled with despair and frustration, or rage even. How dare they treat us like this? In short, conditions like these could have overwhelmed people like you and I. But Paul and Silas were not overwhelmed, or beaten down, or defeated. What had happened to them wasn't right, and yet they refused to be controlled by their circumstances. They faced the unfairness of what they had experienced and focused on God. So they used singing and prayer as a tool to control, escape the control of their captors. They may have been physically inside a prison, but they chose to be mentally in the presence of their Savior. In short, those who had mistreated them could chain their bodies, but not their souls. Their singing and prayers gave them the power to rise above their circumstances. So when you and I sing to God, when we surround ourselves with music that glorifies God, we're actively putting ourselves into the presence, the very presence of God. And God literally lifts us up and changes us and our circumstances. But there's something even more powerful than this that can take place when we sing. Third, singing gives us a tool to teach and witness with as well. For Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So one of the most overlooked aspects of Paul and Silas's experience in prison, in prison was what that was that it, they prayed and sang hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. I don't think Paul and Silas intended to have others listening as they sang, but it would be a little hard to miss, don't you think? So here these two men have been beaten mercilessly. They have been placed in the deepest, darkest, and forbidding corner of the prison. And they have been placed in stocks, which were generally not designed for comfort. As far as other prisoners were concerned, these men would have been expected to howl in protest, to curse in rage, and offer or suffer in silence. But these men were crazy. They were singing praises to God. You'd have thought that this was a church service, not a dungeon sound. But were they crazy? These men were so in love with Jesus that even in prison they sang his praises. And because they did this naturally, they literally witnessed by their singing. Their voices reached the cells of other prisoners and the ears of the jailer who had locked them into their cell. And this witness was so strong that when the ground shook beneath the floors of the prison that night, the jailer came to them and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And then the jailer took these two missionaries to his home, where Paul and Silas taught the jailer and his family what they should believe about Jesus. And that very night, Paul and Silas baptized this Philippian jailer and his family into Christ. So singing is a powerful tool for witnessing. I once read a story, it's a true story, of a young boy in India who had been to a missionary school near his house. Among other things, he received food and a place to sleep, and he spent time in their children's classes. 
One day as the boy was walking down the street, he was loudly singing one of the songs he'd heard at the mission. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Other children heard him, and they asked him to sing the whole song to them. And when he did so, they asked him who this Jesus was, and what this book called the Bible was. And the boy told them he didn't know, but he took the whole group back to the mission where they heard the story for themselves. And many of them became Christians because one little boy witnessed to them in a song. A song that he didn't even understand the words of. So music is a powerful tool. It can change us. It can change our circumstances. It can change the lives of people around us. But there are people who don't like to sing. They come to believe their singing is an embarrassment. They find themselves identifying with the three-year-old who sang, I love you, Lord, and I lift up my noise. <laughs> One expert noted that approximately 40% of Christians have come to believe that singing should be left to those who can sing. They don't like to sing out loud, and they prefer to leave that to those who can carry a tune. In his book, Psalms of the Heart, George Sweeting illustrated a great truth from his experience of two Moody Bible Institute graduates, John and Elaine Beckman. God called them to missionary work in the Chol Indians of southern Mexico. Sweeney reported that they rode mules and traveled by dugout canoes to reach this tribe. They labored 25 years with other missionaries to translate um, the New Testament into the language of the Choi Indians. Cho. Today the Chol Church is thriving. More than 12,000 Christians make up the Chol Christian community, which is financially self-supporting as well. 